about doesn't have a lot of really important thoughts to put together. And if they all come together, it's going to be so powerful because I'm telling you on the mountain, I was just like, man, this is it. This is a really it moment. And I usually don't feel so confident when I come in here. I'm always like starting to feel like I'm starting to feel now, but on the mountain today, I was just like, this is really, really vital and very, very incredible. And I tried recording it last night and it came out pretty good for 15 minutes. I was like, that is really, really right. And if I write the notes down, I can kind of read through them and it's just not the same as if I can flow into it. And the flow is extremely easy to destroy. It's like trying to build a fire and there's too much wind blowing and it knocks it out or the rain starts coming and it puts it out and I start fires out there. Sometimes it takes me up to an hour to even get the fire truly started. And um, the way I communicate, um, just so people will understand why I'm so delicate, especially in the intro stages of it, is because I, the way I communicate is, is like an epic way of communicating, but I have to build pieces to the foundation first, and a lot of times I start to talk about one part of a foundation, just one little block of like 10 that need to be clearly established, and then someone's already there, like, oh yeah, that reminds me of this and this and this, and I'm like, it's like, man, we're never going to get anywhere, but tonight we're going to get in somewhere today, because I believe this is really, really um, concrete and powerful and foundational. I think everybody's going to be really blessed, so um, please allow me to um, treat you like dried up stumps and crickets that don't know any better because they don't do anything they never disrupt me they just do what they do in natural you know and that's that's how i can talk and that's how i flow when there's nothing going on and in the truck by myself i do most of my sermons by myself in the truck and thoughts flow and then i start to hit notes that i never ever 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 would have hit had i not got to flow and start somewhere it's the same way i used to draw when i was younger in an assembly line and um um, sometimes I had nothing to do, and there's cardboard right here, and I take my pen and I start to draw something, and people would say, hey, what are you drawing there? And I'd say, I don't know. I have no idea. But as soon as it starts to look like something, then it starts to take form, and then it starts to get somewhere, and I'm like, boom, there you go. And I drew this one time. I drew it like a, like a monkey feeding its baby or something like that, and it looked so good. I was like, man. You know, and that's actually the same way I preach. I, I really never know how it's going to turn out. And so sometimes I write notes to get an idea, and I start it, and it's a seed I plant, and hopefully it comes out. But it, it can be plucked up very, very easily. Make sense? Yeah. Amen? Okay. Perfect. I'm going to go ahead and check out um, Isaiah chapter 1, just to get some scripture laid out here. Okay, but I'm going to pray, because I'm, I'm, so, I'm so desperate for this to come out right, that this, this will truly be a real word, because um, it's going to be for us. In a major way, you know what I mean? Yeah. And as much as we've been in church and all these things, I think that this is going to be a, a real helper for some foundational piece to our thoughts. Um, the battery okay on that? I think so. I don't see where it has the battery thing, but just I would keep going. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, if it cuts out, let me know. Oh, it looks like the ring either. Shoot. Anyways. Um, I've been doing a study out of the book called Knowledge of the Holy, this book right here, and um, this is where he's one of the people that I love a lot, is talking a lot about um, the attributes of God, and um, a lot of them have really taken my attention already, but it was the fifth chapter where he started to talk about the self-existence of God, that it really started to, the wheel started spinning definitely, I was like, whoa, okay, I got it, and I was like running around the fireplace, like, I got it, I'm like, okay, I got it, I think they're thinking how it's going to turn out tonight, and of course you get here and it always feels different. Same with when you want to go street preach, you're like, I could do it tonight. Go out there, and you're like, what was I going to say again? You know, it's always like that. So praise the Lord if you will move just now. Heavenly Father, if you breathe tonight, there will be real life here. There will be a real touch. There will be a real move, God. I know how desperate we are for a genuine touch, Lord God. And I pray that you breathe upon this word, Lord. It means a lot to me, Lord. And I pray that hearts would be receptive to this touch, Lord. And that the understanding would be very clear, Lord. Because when you breathe, it is easy to see. And I pray that I would not be in the way that you would be able to breathe through and feed your sheep. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, verse 1 is... The vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. 
Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib, but Israel doth not know. My people doth not consider. Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evil doers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger, they are gone away backward. Why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick, and the whole and the heart, the whole heart faint. From the sole of the foot even unto the head there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been dis they have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate, your cities are burned with fire, your land strangers devour it in your presence, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom, we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Okay? So right now you can see that God is not happy with his number one people on earth. And he compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. In verse 10, he starts talking to Sodom and Gomorrah. But because he's comparing his own people to this, you can, you can definitely stand to reason that he's talking to his people. Because the initial doesn't say he's talking to Sodom. He says he's talking to Jerusalem and Judah. The key cities which were originally called by his name. Amen? Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings of rams, and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks, or of lambs, or of he goats. When ye come to appear before me, who hath required this at your, at your hand, to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense, is an abomination unto me. The new moons and Sabbaths, the callings of the assemblies, I cannot, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from me. When you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Okay, you can see right here, he's talking about the sacrifices that he has commanded them to give. And God wants these sacrifices. It was a commandment he gave to them. And right now, because they are so unfaithful to him, he's saying, I don't want them anymore. What he used to want, he doesn't want anymore. Okay? Now, this is going to start to get us into the thought. Have you ever had somebody try to give you something nice, like a hug or a gift? or something like that, pre, before they had ever made the issue right with you. We've all gone to situations, I know we are to get forgiven, all these kinds of things, but it doesn't mean that offense won't come, challenges like that won't come, where you don't feel peace with somebody because they really did hurt you, and you don't sense that they really care to do anything about the issue, and you really do feel it, and they try to say, here's a nice thing, and you're like, thanks, but no thanks, I don't want the nice thing that I normally would like, but because it's coming from you, it's an abomination to me. I don't want that $100 bill because it's coming from you and you have offended me. And now every time you look at me, you make me feel like I'm going to cringe. And God is exactly what God is saying. My own bride, I told you to do these things. Now I'm telling you they make me sick because you are not being true to me. You're, 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 they've always done all kinds of different things and he's always listed them off. And later on it shows you the things he wants him to clear up, and you can check that out another time. But the point is, is there is a time when God does not like the things he has required of us because of our own faithfulness to him. Think about this real quick. 
We know who we know the devil's state right now is bad news. Okay? He has already done something that was so off the charts that there's nothing he can do to be redeemed. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. Who? The devil. Yes. Okay. Now, would it be impressive to God at all if the devil was to say, I'm gonna go take five minutes to go walk an old lady across the street? I'm gonna do a good deed. Do you think God would be impressed? No. From a heart that says, I will be like the Most High? The devil said, I will be like God. It was a sin of rebellion and trying to lust for a throne that did not belong to him. He wanted to take over God's throne. He wants to, yeah. Take it over. So listen carefully, okay? Mm -hmm. God would not be impressed with this at all. There's an interesting scripture. It's also in Isaiah 64. I don't, don't turn there. I'll just tell it to you. It's very easy. You've already heard it a hundred times. It says that our righteousness is like filthy rags to God. And sometimes I'm just thinking, but why? God, people are trying to do nice things out there. Isn't that a good deal? And he says, no. For the same reason... I would not be happy with the devil walking a lady across the street, going to visit someone in the hospital, going to visit the orphans and the widows. I don't care what he does because his core is evil. His core has already said, I will lust for a throne and I will not let God be on the throne. In my own mind. That's what the devil said. In my own mind, I want the throne, not God. That's what he said. And so it doesn't matter what nice thing he does, and it doesn't matter what nice thing an atheist does, or an unconverted person does, or a lukewarm Christian does, because in his core, he still says, I want the throne. I'm on the throne. God is not. I want to show you something that will help us understand what a horrifying crime against the, the true God it is. Imagine one man, it's a baby, he grows up, starts to have a brain, starts to look around himself, and starts to say, you know what? I look around, I see things around me, I see trees, I see mountains, I see rivers, I see, I see cities, I see all kinds of things going around me, and I am not dumb enough to think that I had anything to do with any of that. That's all there. People have been there older than me. I went out there and tested how long does it take a tree to grow. It took me 10 years to watch it. I studied it myself, found out. So those other trees must have been there a lot longer than I have been. Something has been here before me. I am not the first thing on this planet. Where did it all begin? A natural mind says it must fit into something that I understand, but a biology, biological position says this. Like produces like, and life produces life. If you have a genuine scientific attitude, you'd say something alive had to have started before me, and he existed before me. All these other things have ex existed before me, but there had to be something that existed before all of that. Those things do, yes, exist. But they don't exist without Him. All things consist and do exist because of Him. But my Lord, Almighty God, He exists before all things, and He is existing all on His own. He is self-existing. Amen? Amen? God is not being held up by anything. Everything is being held up by Almighty God. He is self-existing. And when a man gives a genuine revelation of the self-existence of Almighty God, he sees something, whether or not he was born into it or not. All that kind of stuff is rhetoric and it is of the devil to fight about that nonsense. All have fallen short of the glory of God and all have lusted for a throne and put themselves on the throne of their own life and said, I will rule my own life. And if you ever get a true glimpse of the self-existence of Almighty God, it is a literal crime, no different than Satan. You can see in my own heart, Lord, every nice thing I've ever done is an abomination to you because I am still core evil. It is not drunkenness that is sin. It is not sexual sin that is sin. It is not murder that is sin. It is not hatred. It is not unforgiveness. It is not bitterness. It is none of those things. The core is self. Myself is on the throne. And until you dethrone and put the Yah Yahweh Almighty God, self-existing God on the throne, you are committing a crime no different than Lucifer. The self-existence of God. He's always existed. Before the trees. The trees were before us. 
There's some trees on this earth that are thousands of years old, and they are huge. They are massively huge. They are intimidating enough. Imagine the God who said, I speak a word in six days, it all was come to play. Not seeds, trees. Not baby giraffes, giraffes. Not baby boy, a man. Not baby, baby girl, a woman. God created the full product. <coughs> Amen? Amen. When a man comes to the realization that there's something outside of him, there is no difference at all for him to say that. That is the only reason. I could never understand that for myself. How could somebody be nice? Because you know Christians, we say we want to operate in the spirit, we want to do these things, and we say, Lord, I, I, I don't know. Sometimes I, I feel like I have an agreement with these people because they're so nice. I, you, God, you call me to the, to the mission field to, to go help the poor. I found atheists out there helping the poor. Why is it right for me and not right for them? Because you're doing it because you got off the throne. I led you there. They're just doing it to be nice. But like I said, what, how much would it be impressive if the, if the devil was to do that? His core puts himself on the throne. It has nothing to do with what you did, good or evil. It has everything to do with whether or not God is on the throne or not. Amen? Mm -hmm. I had I had someone um, that used to um, abuse me, and they go buy me a piece of jewelry every time. They never say sorry. They just go buy me another piece of jewelry, and I said that is just a piece of metal. Exactly. That is not what I really want, mm -hmm. and I think that's how God looks at it too. Mm -hmm. It's like if I wear a wedding ring, and we're married to Christ. <coughs> If I'm wearing his signature on myself, on my life, and there's no love behind what I'm wearing, then it's just a piece of tin on my finger. It, it does me no good to even look at it. I might as well just throw it away because it's, it's no good. There's no love in it. And, you know, I believe that God wants us the same way, genuine, like, like you're saying. Right. Um, because we can we can give all sorts of gifts to people and be nice to all sorts of people, but yeah. if there's not true, genuine love behind in our heart for that person and and really wanting God's best for that person, then the whole the whole effort of the thing is no good. Exactly. It's, it's just empty. You can feel it. It doesn't. It didn't make you feel better to get no, jewelry. No, it's, it's an empty thing. It's an empty. But if somebody was nice to you, and they gave you jewelry, you'd be like, "This is great. This person is so wonderful. They take care of me and they give me blessings." And they love me, and then right. I would treasure treasure that, yeah. that that piece of jewelry they gave me because that is it a came very from good their love from their heart. Yeah. And way different than just. It's not here. mixed with self <laughs> and the other. You know, trying to use your own works to make up for your bad deeds. Kathy and I were listening to this other thing. It was really, really powerful. Audio things. I'd really like to get the CDs again. I keep loaning them out. Every time I get them, I just take them. Please, these are so good. And they're both by John Bevere. They're audio books. And one of them is called Rescued. And it has a Christian man standing before the throne. And he had every intention of going to heaven. And his jaw hit the floor. He's like, but Lord, I spent my whole life serving you. And the Lord says, let me show you something. Let's take a look at a video clip of what you were doing here, okay? And you can hear all these shady deals. Hey. You can do this right here, and we'll make a lot of money. You'll be retired by this time, and none of these things will matter. It'll be off your deal. You won't have anything to do with it. Okay, and he's falling. And the Lord says, do you see this? And he says, it's not even the issue that you did it. It's just that my people don't act like that. And if you do mess up, I would have gladly forgiven you, but you didn't even care. Because the core was always you. You came to the church to do your thing, try to give jewelry for the abuse. You make sense? Is that yeah, right? That's an excellent, that's right. That is an excellent yeah. point. It makes all the sense in the world. So our righteousness, and people are going to do that. They're going to, but I did these things in your name. He says, but you did it, and you still never faced up to the only thing that mattered. You have broken my law. You are a, you are a thief of the throne. You know how the Bible says you try to come another way, you'll be a thief or a robber, right? That's right. Because you are trying to steal his throne. There's no other, there's no other pure justice. You know how you look at certain situations and you say, the only perfect justice is plain as day. Well, if you ever get a self, if you get a perfect view of the self-existence of God, the only rightful response is, you're the boss forever. I have no idea, oh Lord, how this is going to look. But I know who you are, and I know I am not you. And I will never be you. My life belongs to you forever. The best I know how, I give myself to you. 
I don't know how to give myself to you, but I purposely, passionately, with all my heart, give myself to you because that's the only right response to understanding the self-existence of God. Amen? Amen. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. I feel like I just missed my point now. Well, you know, that, that he's on the throne and we're not. Right. The only thing, the only question I have is, I can see the whole thing, but uh, how can you be consistent in that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I it's mean, I could say, yeah, you're on the throne, Lord. Yeah. Ten minutes later, I'm doing some stupid little thing to be proud of the life. You know? Well, I'm not going to. I'm just kidding. No. <laughs> well, the Lord, the Lord, when, when there's, there's going to be an initializing change. You know what I'm saying? Like, when I first got saved, I had some struggles that didn't end in a, in a year or two. They ended, they ended later, you know. And I can say over two and a half years, I've had victory over my greatest challenge. And it was just after that that the Lord started opening up doors for me to do stuff, you know. And this is where I'm at right now. And as the Lord shines more light, you say, that's where it's at. That's where I'm standing. And when you really go there for real, you open up another door. You know what I mean? That's that's where the true growth comes when he shines light and shows you. So I don't know what, what you mean. Like, um, well, what, well, How do you have victory over bad habits is what I'm saying. Bad habits? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, things you've done for so long, it's totally automatic. Okay. You never think yeah. about it. Yeah, no, I, like... When you pray and you ask God to help you... Yeah. I've done that a million I struggle, times. Well, it's, it's, I it's funny with because that myself with bad Sister habits Kimberly, like, of all people, said something that actually made a lot of sense to me because when I first came to the Lord, like, He just changed me so much. It was a drastic miracle that He did. Mm -hmm. And it was like, I don't even want to get anywhere near anything that even resembles sin. You know how the Bible says, don't even do anything that, resent, that, even, that even hints towards sexual immorality. Don't even touch anything like that the way people dress and all these other things, the way we joke about says, don't even talk about things people, sinners do in private, okay? So he changed me so marvelously, and I give a little compromise, and it starts to become harder to do what God has already clearly shown me. What Kimberly said, she says this, she says, God will never do it twice. The miracle will happen one time, after that you're going to muscle your way through it. So if you want it, go ahead and get on your hands and knees, and you're going to crawl there and muscle your way through it. And that's exactly how it happened for me. I was like, kind of like messing up. I'm like, oh man, find out this kind of music makes me feel relaxed, compromised. And all of a sudden, boom, falling for it again, falling for it again, watching dudes calming down, relaxing, doing this stuff, not guarding my heart. That's why there's a lot of things I just don't do. I'm like, secular music? No. A lot of Christian music? No. It's just as fleshy to me. I just, it messes me up just as much. It compromises the safe place that I've been in for years now, and I won't compromise for it. So, Whenever you find something that you think is leading you the wrong way, hanging out with certain kind of people, doing certain things like watching sh shows and stuff like that, I could definitely see how that would mess up here. So no, it's just no, horrible. Lord told me to get rid of my TV, so I finally did that. Oh, well, that's good. All, yeah. I, all I have is Christian radio station. But I sometimes have a suspicion that I listen to it too much because it's just another um, escape oh, yeah. from, from reality you know, yeah. in a way. Yeah, once and once. There's there's a there's a there's a tract I seen one time, and this may help us even as Christians. Mm -hmm. But to to reevaluate our own steps, and it was called the Steps for Life. And boy, it was <coughs> good. I put a video on there because I was I I read that thing and I just collapsed because I was like, wow. I I heard that scripture Jesus says, except you hate your father, your mother, your brother, your sister, mm -hmm. you can't be my disciple if you if you don't really have a no for everything else. He says, even the most closest people to you, compared to following me and be my true disciple, you have to have like a, your, your no way for letting anything distract you from the following of Jesus Christ, having that single eye for Jesus, it's like a hatred for everything else. And, it, and like I got a revelation of it, I was just like, that's a really radical thing. If we take that thing seriously, you know what I'm saying, that radical of a cost, it's not, that's where God is. He speaks those words, if you take those red letters seriously, he really is there. And I, I got a revelation of that, and I started looking at this, this track. It has, like, the first step, unconcerned. Speaking some of the word, they don't, they're not concerned about it. They don't care. So that's fine. How about this? And you start to preach longer, and they, like, start to get concerned. Like, hmm, that is a good point. And then the next step was convicted. The Holy Spirit started to reach them and show them, you're busted. They're like, whoa, God, whoa. You know, I've seen people do that before. I started talking about something. This girl's freaking out. Huh? Tells her husband, I'm never going to smoke pot again. She got convicted. Next one is repentance. 
She started to yell, I'm not going to do it again. I don't know what her life is, but she said, I'm not going to do it. And after you really repent and say, these things are never going to happen again. Enter into the saving faith. It was a five-step program. Not concerned? Now I'm getting concerned. Now I'm convicted. Now I'm going to do something about it. Now you're entering into the saving faith. That's the beginning of Christianity right there. The radical cost of it all. People erase that cost. That's like regular old Christianity. That was normal. That's what Paris Reedhead preaches. That's what Charles Spurgeon used to preach. All the old preachers would say it was that radical. And your, and your commitment to Jesus Christ has to be like hatred for everybody else. As mean as that sounds, you know what I'm saying? And it's not mean. It's just saying, I can't let anybody disrupt me. I mean, Jesus Christ's family, was, he was rejected by his own family. So, I mean, he could never have done the will of the Father if he was concerned about his own family. Does that make sense? Amen. Mm -hmm. Anybody understand this self-existence of God just a little better now? Yeah. There's several Thank different, so there's much. several, yeah, amen, there's several different attributes of the Lord. And um, just talking about the names of them is just like, whoa, <coughs> I need to know something about that, you know? And it's, it's gripping. It really is. So I'm going to continue to go through there. We'll bring more with the word and everything to see if we can't break some ground on this whole matter. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for helping to get the word out, Lord God, and uh, I pray that it would take root in our hearts, Lord God, and not be another word we heard for our collection, but a word that does transform, and that does bring joy, and does bring true life, Lord. I don't want anybody that comes to this group to ever be a person that feels like they're bewildered and in the dark, Lord. I want us all to have true joy that comes from you and you alone, Lord. We thank you so much that you're faithful, Lord God. We thank you for your self-existence, Lord God. Thank you for great books that help us to understand you better in this noisy world that tries to distract us from seeing you for who you are. Thanks for giving me time on the mountain to seek you long enough to hear a word this good, Lord. Thank you for the people here tonight, Lord. Thank you for all those on the internet watching as well. Bless them all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.